have a question for you. What comes to mind when you hear the word soil? If you're a farmer, you might think of something like food, fertilizers, plowing, crops. If you're a scientist, like myself, you might think support, climate change, ecosystem, cycling. And if you are smart enough to be neither of those things, you probably <laughs> think outside, plants, dirty, brown. When you leave this auditorium today, I want one word to stand out in your mind when you think about the soil. That word is alive. The soil beneath our feet is alive. It's alive not in some metaphysical, spiritual sense, but in a very real, tangible, measurable sense. It's a living network, one that we as humans are a part of and depend upon. I mean, look at this photo. To me, it screams life, even though all the earthworms we planted were gone by the time we took the photo. Right? <laughs> you want to think of this living network as being composed of thousands, millions of tiny microorganisms, from bacteria to fungi to protozoa. Collectively, we refer to all of them as microbes. Now, these microbes, you want to think of them as the stomach of the soil. What they do is they take organic material, like leaves and sticks and dead animals, they eat it, they metabolize part of it, and then they turn the rest of it into nutrients that can be used by plants. It's a very neat, continuous cycle, one that's responsible for maintaining life on Earth as we know it. Um, in a lot of ways, the soil is, itself is like a human body. There are a lot of different systems. They're all working together. They're all depending upon each other. When these systems are working together properly, when the body is fit, it can accomplish some amazing things. In a very similar manner, when the soil is healthy, when the soil is fit, it can accomplish some incredible things. It can regulate global climate. It can trap carbon from the atmosphere. It can filter our water as rainwater pours down through it. And something that I'm very close to, it provides enough food to feed our growing population, especially here in Belize. Now, if you have a very healthy, stable soil, you can also have a soil that is weak, a soil that is sick. Oh, well, I will get to that in a minute. Uh, a good example of a healthy soil is the Stan Creek Valley, right here in <laughs> Belize. I'm not biased, I think it's the one of the most beautiful places on earth, but that's not just because I'm from there. Right? <laughs> you look at this picture and what you see is green, you see lush, you see water. There are so many different communities, so many different cultures that have been working together to grow food, to raise their families here for generations long before the British arrived. This is a great example of a healthy soil. But, like I said, if you have something that's healthy, you can also have something that's sick. When these networks start to break down, the agriculture that our societies depend upon falls apart, and those societies themselves start to suffer. Now, I never saw this in Belize. I actually experienced this firsthand somewhere else. When I graduated from college in the US, I got a job offer from a friend of mine. She was like, I would like to grow organic tea. Uh, I would like to market this organic tea to people in cities all over the world. I want to work with these farmers on the ground, and I want you to come with me. There is just one little catch, very small. You're going to have to move to India to do that. The job offer was specifically tailored to me. She said, Daniel, I know we cannot pay you, but we can feed you. Now, <laughs> I like to eat, so I was on the next plane. Right? I get there, and I learned that we would be working in the Brahmaputra River Valley, which is one of the largest river valleys in the world, extremely fertile soils. And the more I learned about it, the more things started to sound familiar. You have fertile soil, tropical climate, lots of rainfall, plantation agriculture, British colonial past, anything sound familiar here? <laughs> right? It's very similar to Belize. And so I get there, and I'm expecting to see something lush and green, like the Sand Creek Valley. What I saw was something like this. Farmers in the area were having huge issues with pests, with diseases, with declining crop yields due to irregular rainfall caused by climate change. 
the farmers were bringing in less crops, which means that they had less stuff to sell, which meant that the communities themselves did not have as much money coming in. And these farming communities, they really started to suffer. When you talk to these farmers and you ask them, why is this happening? What, what do you think is the cause of it? There's this real feeling of powerlessness, of hopelessness. The soil is dead. The soil is dying. There's nothing we can do. A lot of farmers were trying to turn to mineral fertilizers in order to grow crops. But even after a couple seasons, those crops were failing. So our team, um, we were a little bit intimidated, but we buckled down. We started to do some research to try and figure out why this is happening. And very slowly, a story started to emerge. So let me talk nerdy to you. <laughs> in a healthy soil, you have plants and microbes working together as a team. The plant roots provide shelter for the microbes, as well as holding the soil together to make sure it doesn't get eroded. The microbes, in return, eat organic material such as sticks, leaves, dead animals, metabolize part of it, and turn the rest into nutrients that can be used by plants. Again, very neat, continuous cycle. Nature works like that. Now, if you cultivate year after year, you do not give the soil a chance to rest, what happens is that this organic material starts to run out. The microbes consume it. There's no way to regenerate it. When that happens, the soil, in essence, goes hungry. Then you add in irregular rainfall due to climate change. So now the living soil is hungry and thirsty. Then you add in all these pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, which don't just target pests. They target huge portions of the microbial community. And then it's no wonder that the soil starts to get sick. So the microbes start to die. Because the microbes are dying, there are less nutrients for the plants. Because there are less nutrients for the plants, they start to die. And then all of a sudden, there is nothing holding the soil in place anymore. The combined pressures of lack of organic matter due to long-term cultivation and irregular rainfall due to climate change were killing the living part of the soil, making it unable to support human agriculture. So when we figured this out, I mean, the first thing I did was go into my room and breathe into a paper bag to try and calm myself down because, honestly, I don't know what I'm supposed to do to fix all of this. But <laughs> luckily, people have been working on this for quite a while. And the advice is extremely simple. If you have somebody that's hungry, you feed them, right? So we started with the tastiest delicacy known to microbes and a substance that I have spent far too much of my life handling, cow poop. <laughs> we used that cow poop to make compost piles. Farmers were adding organic material back to the soil. They were feeding it. At the same time, we worked with these farmers in order to reduce their dependence on pesticides and herbicides. It takes a little while for you to take a healthy soil and make it sick. And in a very similar way, it takes a while to take a sick soil and bring it back to health. But after two years, the results were amazing, all right? Farmers were starting to feel good again, yields were increasing, disease was decreasing, and they were motivated to continue feeding the soil. But I saw this, and during the course of this research, I realized we do not know very much about the microbial community in the soil. It is a little bit like when I first moved to India. I did not speak the language. I did not understand the culture. But when you look, you can see structure. You can see order. You can see people communicating. You can see them working together to build something greater than themselves. In a similar way, we are just starting to understand the language and the culture of these microbes in the soil, how they communicate with each other, how they communicate with plants, how they work together as a community, and how they work with us in order to promote sustainable agriculture. We are just starting to understand this, and this is a huge problem. Because I've worked in a lot of places all over the world, and everywhere I have gone, I have seen evidence of soil destruction. A good example right here, this is the Yangtze River Valley in China. Huge amounts of silting and erosion have led to clogging and pollution of the waterways, just due to agricultural expansion. 
in Scotland, years of lead mining and coal mining and dumping have created areas where nothing can grow because the, the metal levels in the soil are so toxic. Up to one third of the world's arable land has been destroyed due to human activity and we still do not have almost any idea how they work, right? If you want a better example, one that's closer right here in Belize, look no further than the Mayan civilization. Back in the day, a huge civilization, they just collapsed completely. One of the theories for this is that an increase in population led to an increase in deforestation, which caused a shift in the climate. Less rain started to fall. The soil went thirsty. The soil was no longer able to support the agriculture and the communities that depended upon it. When there's no food, the population collapsed, which turned once great cities such as Caracol, abandoned ruins in a generation, 100 years. <sighs> Deforestation, climate change, reducing crop yields. Does any of this sound familiar? These are things that are happening in Belize today. And we as Belizeans are extremely susceptible to them. Tropical soils, like the ones that you find here in Belize, concentrate most of their organic matter, most of their life, in the top 6 to 12 inches. Below that, what you get is this weathered orange material that is full of iron and aluminum, which are not things that plants need to grow. So if we lose that top foot, those top 6 inches, our agriculture is not going to be able to produce enough food to feed our population. If we lose that top foot, we might as well be trying to grow crops on Mars. So, my experiences around the world and here in Belize are what led me to go back to school for my PhD. Uh, what I'm doing now in this period of my studies is digging a lot of holes, first of all, but I'm also working to understand how microbes communicate with each other, how they work together to build soil structure, and how we as human beings can work with them in order to promote sustainable agriculture. Um, if you want the answer to what we should do, you should probably come back to me in five years when I'm done with my PhD. But some of the things that I've come up with or some of the things that I've learned about um, in my first year is that we can promote sustainable farming practices. If you're a farmer, things like crop rotation, things like planting diverse crops, things like adding organic matter back to the soil in order to feed the living part of the soil. Now, I do appreciate that many of you are probably not farmers, so I'll say that there's a lot that we as Belizeans can do as well. We can take an interest in where our food comes from. We can learn who is growing our food, where is it coming from, what practices are they using in order to grow it, how many of us really know where that tomato or that cucumber that we find in the supermarket came from, right here in Belize. We can speak up against unsustainable farming practices, such as deforestation, such as hillside slash and burning, that kill or erode or degrade the living part of the soil, yields decrease after two to three years. And the most important thing, we can educate others. We can indulge our curiosity. We can say we can promote research. And let's be honest, we can play in the mud because it's fun and everybody likes to do it. Don't tell me you don't. <laughs> So, the soil beneath our feet is alive. Let's keep it that way. Yeah.